Welcome to Bound by Books. I'm steamy contemporary author Sherry Hayes, and I am joined today by my fellow host, Tina Moss. Hello. How are you, Tina? I'm okay. I'm a sci fi romance author, Tina Moss, and Sherry and I are a hot mess today, but we're going to get through this. Yes, podcast. we are. <laughs> It is it has been an interesting day. I am um I am trying to finish a manuscript. I it yeah. is due to my editor today. Which one is uh, it? Luckily I am on the very uh this is claiming his kiss. Claiming his kiss. So it's okay. the fourth novel in my serpents yeah, in my serpents kiss series. Awesome. So it's BDSM. Uh, and I am, uh, like I said, I've got everything written except for the bonus chapter that my readers will get if they sign up for my newsletter. So if they love the story and they want more of the characters, they can sign up for my newsletter and get this bonus chapter, which is great. But when I wrote the first part, when I wrote it out, when I just like, you know, wrote it, winged it, got it on paper, Mm -hmm. it was like 900 words. And I'm like... Mm. I don't know. I think I need more. So, and I didn't want to change the ending of it, which means I had to kind of backpedal and like start the scene soon, like start the scene sooner. Right. Um, Cause I love how it ends. It ends perfect. It got all every, all my, you know, things wrapped up and mm-hmm. oh, I'm like, this is, <laughs> this is crazy. So it, it, it it's been an Madness. interesting day and I hate deadlines. Yeah, I, I hate. I know you thrive off of them. <laughs> I don't know if I, I thrive off. Them. Of them. I hate being. <laughs> you do them enough. You should thrive off of is them. The word thriving is not the word I would use. I I need them. They are part of my existence, but I don't know mm. if I'm thriving. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I hear I just, you. I this last this last couple of weeks, I knew this deadline was coming, and it was just like trying to. I was trying to basically pump out a chapter a day and mm-hmm. to get it done. And I, that's just not how I normally write. I'm usually about, <clears throat> about 1500 words a day is kind of like your norm. My comfort yeah. zone. Yeah. Because I, yeah, well, I'm a pantser. So everything I write is, you know, I'm, I'm making up in my head as I go. It's a lot of brain power yeah. to be creating something from scratch as I go. And so 1500 words is usually my sweet spot where I like to just, you know, that it's not too much. My brain doesn't feel fried. Um, and I, you know, my creativity's flowing. I'm good, but man, over 1500 words, I have to really push myself to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've had to this last two weeks mm-hmm. in order to make this stuff. <laughs> yeah. That makes a lot of sense though, from like a pantser perspective of like you using up so much energy on 1500 words where like I'm you know I'm an outliner so I'm a plotter and I don't need as much brain power because I've like used all the brain power before to kind of create the outline because mm-hmm. you so already when the... know what's gonna happen right so when writing kind comes that's why I'm kind of like you know a maniac at the keyboard just typing away on these crazy tight deadlines but I do also take like time in be- like I haven't I've started outlining it but I haven't started writing the next book because I'm like in the process of brainstorming and thinking so that by the time I do mm-hmm. go to write, it is like all the words are there already. It's, it's hard to explain. Right. Are. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I, I, I think I've told this story before. I, uh, when I was at a book signing conference, whatever you want to call it, it was kind of, it, it, it was for all different genres. So it wasn't like when you think of a book conference, you think of, you know, usually it's genre specific, like it's all, right. you know, mostly romance writers or mostly fantasy or whatever. Um, but this had everything from nonfiction to children's to mm. romance. It had kind of a little bit of everything. And it's in its local here in Ohio. Nice. So anyway, so I was sitting behind beside uh, this woman. She wrote more women's fiction with romantic elements to it versus like straight genre romance. Mm-hmm. But she, she, her outlines were so detailed. Like she was talking through the and she was telling me like, she, when she got ready to write this book, she had her entire office floor was covered in notes, and then oh, wow. she had actually written out full sentences like full mm-hmm. sentences she wanted to be in these you know in these scenes and it was just a matter of all of the content that she'd already outlined together I was like 
that just yeah. seems so overwhelming and confusing to me <laughs> as a pantser. That's just like, but I always find it interesting that people like, I think outlining is overwhelming, mm-hmm. but I think it's funny because people, people look at me and they go like, how in the world do you write a whole entire novel and have it make sense? Just pantsing it. Yeah. I've, that's what I've always wondered about pantsers. Like, how do you have, you know, your, your romance beats or your plot points, or especially if you're doing a series, because a lot of the times with world building for me, and especially with the sci-fi stuff, like I need kind of certain things to be in certain places. So I, I write that down and I need to know where that is. I can't imagine like doing that by the seat of my pants. Do you have those things like planned out for the series or is it just all pants? Oh, it's all pants. See, that's, it's all that's, pants. That's the wildest thing to me. <laughs> genuinely have anxiety it's just right I, 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 know. I just I, that's it the thing. totally works for it's you and right. I get it and I appreciate yeah. it and I I just cannot it, I, it's so funny <laughs> because in like the writerly world this is such a thing with writers always talk about the pantser versus the plotter and I want to <laughs> just get inside the pantser's brain and be like but how but how do you do this and I'm sure you feel the exact same way so it's wild so yeah it's 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 an it's an unlearned of the traditional way but yeah we're actually gonna dive down a different path today not plant plotting and pantsing <laughs> um we're gonna talk a little bit about something i actually am really interested to hear tiana's perspective about because uh i'm gonna be quite upfront i do not know a lot about the subject matter that we're talking about um i know a little bit about it but not a ton so i am i'm interested in learning right along with you um we're gonna be talking about the different types of rights book rights first this is the wide branch of what's known as sub rights or subsidiary rights Mm -hmm. right so they're all different types audio i think is the most common and probably the one that authors are most familiar with and going to dive in most likely after their ebook and print rights it's kind of like the the pipeline is ebook print audio next for authors Um, And audio is interesting because you now have a couple of different ways to go. So let's just talk about legal rights to begin with. Mm -hmm. Anytime you license your book, right, you still own the copyright, but you are giving a license to somebody else to either distribute it directly yourself through Amazon or aggregators like Draft2Digital or direct through Kobo, Apple, Google Play, et cetera you are still giving the rights to somebody, in this case, the retailers, to be able to distribute your book. So you own your copyright, but you're giving certain rights to certain people. And that's if you're indie direct. Obviously, you go traditional or small press or anything like that, then you're giving the publisher the rights to do those same things. And that's typically through ebook and print. So now you have this whole other world. What do you do with all of these other rights? So audio is the easiest to dive into because just like ebook and print, you can go independent with this and self produce, or you can sell your right. audio licensing rights. Say that five times fast. Right. Now, now let, <laughs> yeah. Now let, let's dive into a little bit into this because this is actually one of the few things I do know a little bit about. Mm-hmm. Um, your, your audio, most people go, well, there's two main ways to go. You can either go exclusive with Audible, mm-hmm. which, again, is a subsidiary of Amazon and you will make more royalties on percentage wise if you do that. But then there are places like find away books, which is now owned by Spotify Mm -hmm. um, and a few others, but find away is probably the biggest. um, And this is for distribution. This is audio distribution, um, which you can also through production. So you're talking about just to be clear, you're talking about distributing yeah. and also producing the book with these companies. However, you can right. produce outside of these companies and then only mm-hmm. distribute with these companies. And to make it further complicated, you can also sell your rights directly <laughs> and have them produce it. But we'll get we'll get into all that. We'll break it down a little bit more. But go ahead. Keep yeah, going. It, <laughs> Sorry. There's a reason why this is complicated. I mean, it, it, that's the topic. thing. I think this is one of the reasons why authors are sometimes independent authors are sometimes hesitant to dip their toes into these various um, options because it's not as straightforward as producing an ebook or a print book with an ebook or a print book 
you kind of know you're you're editing well you're writing you're it writing you're writing editing all that kind of stuff yep and then you're um formatting, formatting it and, it and it then mm-hmm. yeah and then putting it out it's done you don't you don't really have to worry about it but um audio and foreign rights and movies and tv stuff that it, it's it's all so many so much more complicated yeah audio yeah the production part of it i mean you can find whatever narrator you want mm-hmm. does i mean you can do it yourself so again i'll want. give you an example of i think the best way to do this is probably to do an example so i started um by finding narrators in my genre that i really enjoyed and who were popular in the mm-hmm. genre I reached out directly right. to that narrator who was an experienced narrator and had his own production and capabilities of doing it himself um, to produce mm-hmm. it, to actually create it. Then my plan was to take that to an audio production company or an audio house, which is which is separate from audio publishers, to get the editing done and to get the um, sound quality up to where it should be because this narrator didn't do that. Then I would decide between would I go direct like in an in an ebook program through KU in this case through Audible or would I go wide and in this case I was considering find a way voices now that's self-production and you could do that with your own um, voice as well like you could be the narrator for your book it's probably the most it would get you the most in terms of return on investment but it is very expensive to put out and it does take a long time because the standard hours produced when you hire a narrator just on average can be anywhere from the lower end of a hundred dollars per hour all the way up to, you know, thousands of dollars per hour for finished product. Mm-hmm. I believe the average is around 150 to 250 if you're looking for a narrator. And that's again, that's all on your own. So if you were to go through a program like Audible or Find Away Voices, you can do what's called royalty shares, where you're not paying the full price per hour. And you're splitting either royalties with them, either, you know, 50-50 or a certain percentage, like you're you're doing, let's say, you know, $50 per hour for finished hour, you're paying them and then giving them a percentage of the sales on top of that. So there's a couple different ways to do that. Sherry, did you have um, an audio created for your books? Have you done, gone through the audio process? Um, I have only done done it through a publisher so okay. um when i would when I, my when my books were when my earlier books were with a small publisher they decided to produce audio for or get audio produced um for three of my books in-house and, they were doing um, in-house audio production no they, oh, they, okay. they contracted out to do that with a with a production company mm-hmm. um and it was great but when they went to go when i wrote the fourth book in that series because it was my finding in a series my most popular series um i it that book is 146,000 words Mm. and when they went to go uh to the production company to find out exactly like you know the cost and stuff of producing it um they got a quote of twelve thousand dollars and they so (laughs) yeah they were like we've decided not to pursue this any further um because keep in mind this was close to 10 years ago so Mm -hmm. audiobooks weren't quite as popular then as they were now so they were afraid that in five years which is what the contract was for the book um and you know for sure they knew they had five years to make up you know the right the cost. most likely they, they weren't recoup sure it. they were going to make up 12 yeah. right they weren't sure That's they could recoup twelve thousand dollars in, in that in period of years. time so yeah yeah, so they they decided against it, and they said they gave me the audio rights back and said you can go and publish it on your you know produce it on your own if you want. However, again, that's a wow. hefty price tag for an indie yeah. author to to try to swallow. Um, so I haven't yet. I would love to do it, but I have not yet, and um, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, a book that long is going to be upwards of like 40 to 50 hours of finished audio. So you're talking 60 is what, 60 they, is what they said. Yeah. Ooh. So 60 mm-hmm. hours and you do, you know, you do the math of of the average, even yeah. if you found it a less expensive narrator, you're still looking at 6,000 mm-hmm. easy for the very oh, yeah. you know, lower end of, of finished product. <laughs> yeah. So that's yeah. yeah, but that's good that they gave you the rights back. So let's quickly just dive into 
why I didn't go forward in producing it myself. I was very much ready to, I was very much to, you know, invest. My books are shorter. They're under 50,000 words. So it's a, you know, more cost effective um, production mm-hmm. process. But as I was doing all this, as many of you know, who've been listening to the podcast, I own City Owl Press and we work with um, a few different agents, partner, business partners and, and companies um, on different rights. So at the time, our audio agent was pitching a wide catalog of our books, including my my own personal ones, and um, came back with an audio offer for me. And because mm-hmm. of that, I decided to sell the rights to my first three books in series. I figured that was a good number to give me um, an idea of how this particular company, which I can't reveal yet because it's, the contract's not all done, it's not all finished. I can just say that the offer is out there and that I've accepted it. Um, but because of all of this, I'm able to see how production goes and marketing with this company. So essentially, I've sold it like you would sell to a traditional publisher, but I've sold it to mm-hmm. a traditional audio publisher. So this is the other route that you can go is is kind of through, um, we'll say, trade audio publishing. Right. And there's several different companies. The biggest on the market right now are Podium, Tantor. Blackstone off the top of my head. I know there's a few others out there. Um, Find a way has its own mm-hmm. division now. And I'm sure with Spotify buying them that there'll be, there'll be more opportunity as well. And of course, Audible itself has a buying um, side of it. So it's kind of has both similar to how Amazon has its own imprints that, that buy uh, Montlake, I think is their big one. Um, so Audible and Find a way, although they have, production side they also have buying sides the same way that they do in ebook for example amazon has Montlake lake publishing audible has a division where they will buy the licensing rights as well for audio um we can we can do a whole podcast on just audio honestly i was but... i was going to say i'm wondering <laughs> if we should maybe stick to audio because there, i mean there's there's so much to explore with audio and if people want a deep right. dive into audio just you know let us know. Give us the the likes, yeah, let the us thumbs know. up, the five stars on all the platforms. And if we see that, then we can do a full audio only uh, podcast. Yeah. But so, have you dipped into mm-hmm. foreign? Or if you, you want to hear something else, so For if sure. you want to go more things, no, I have not. And I actually would like to. Yeah, you um, should. I just honestly do not know where to start. I really don't. I mean, especially with my Finding Anna series. I mean, I I have. I have done very well with that series over mm-hmm. a very long period of time. I mean, the first book came out 12 years ago in the yeah. series and it still sells very well. It's still my best selling series. Um, so I would love to get it in foreign rights because I have readers from all over the world. I mean, all those, but of course I can only really access the readers in those markets that do speak or English. read at least fluent English. Right. So I would love to get into foreign rights, uh, especially so. So foreign rights is translation and the biggest market in romance is typically Germany. However, Spanish speaking countries and Latin America are also getting much more into this. But but Germany is usually the ones that most people go for out of the gate. And again, you can self-produce, you can hire translators, you can hire um, translation editors, and you can do all this on your own. It is, you know, cost prohibitive. It does get more complicated when you have to trust people, because if you don't speak or read the language, then it's much more difficult to be able to say like, you know, okay, this is this is correct or not. Um, However, there is the self-production option. And just like you you would put your books up on the different distribution platforms, you would do so on the Amazon in Germany platform or the, you know, whatever Mm -hmm. platforms are relevant to the country that you're translating to. The second option, again, is to sell your rights to foreign publishers. This is much more difficult to do directly, and I would recommend looking at agents who sell foreign rights. So obviously, um, my company works with a foreign rights team. They go to the big international book festival every year, which is in Frankfurt, and they over you know the year pitch our books to different foreign publishers, and we've had several deals. But if you're selling really well in the U.S. and you feel like, okay, I think it's time to make that move, then I would go to Twitter, Query Tracker, 
Quarry Manager, Twitter, I say for um, agents wish list, and just look, and most of all, Publishers Marketplace, look to see who has good sales in your genre in different foreign countries, because that will tell you who is selling foreign rights. And usually, if it's a larger agency, especially, they have a foreign rights division. And if you could, you know, query them and say, hey, I'm an indie author, or I'm trade published, but they're not, I still own my foreign rights, whatever your deal is. And I'm selling really well. Here's my sales over the last, you know, three months, let's say, in in the English market and make a pitch for why you think your books would do really well overseas, then you're more likely to acquire Mm -hmm. a foreign rights agent that way. So have you looked into foreign rights at all, whether self-producing? I know you said you you haven't done it, but have you looked into it at all for doing it for your Finding Anna series? Mm Mm-mm. Okay. No, I have it. Some of that's time constraints. Oh, um, yeah. and some of that's just not really knowing how to <laughs> yeah, yeah, you said time constraints. Uh-huh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, uh I I would honestly at this point in my in my life, I would probably be more inclined to um basically give my rights to a foreign publisher, mm-hmm. you know, to produce because um, I don't have the time to like you said, try to monitor a translation, right. especially when I don't have the ability to know whether or not it's right. I would have to not only do that, but I'd have to track down readers mm-hmm. within, you know, hopefully in my fan base that speak that language and would be willing to essentially beta read for me these translations and let me know if it's correct or not or anything needs to be fixed right because i wouldn't be able to do that and i don't you know google translate's not something you can rely on for that yeah. and <laughs> it's know? very I mean, there's, tricky there's things especially with my books i mean i i yep. tend tricky because you're having certain language in english that may or may mm-hmm. not directly translate into another language so it's not a matter of just having a good translator mm-hmm. You have to have a good translator in that genre or somebody who's familiar with like BDSM terms right. in another language. Right. And not just that, but I, because all my books are set in the Midwest of the United States, I tend to write in that type of language, mm-hmm. that type of rhythm, uh, use uh, use sayings and phrases that are common in this part of the country and it would be a matter of does that translate into Mm -hmm. a foreign language because some of them probably will have difficulty doing that you know if if they're not very comfortable in american english and in whatever language it is it may be hard for them to pick up because they may do a literal translation and that may not be the case right because if if I mean, every language has it, you know, it's not just, you know, American English Mm -hmm. where they have terms and phrases that may sound like one thing, but Mm -hmm. are actually a mean something completely different. And the person where you get into foreign translations and different languages and stuff, you've got to know that, especially, I mean, even, even in English, you got to be, you got to be kind of aware in markets because there's certain things, there's certain phrases that in the United States, it, that phrase may mean one thing, but in the UK, it may mean something completely different. Yep. They may both have it, <laughs> but it may mean something completely different. So, which I always find interesting, kind of go down a side trail here. I always find interesting. I can always tell, or I should say most, I can tell a lot when I'm re- listening or reading a book and the characters are in the United States, but you can tell if the author is from the UK. <laughs> or Australia or yeah. something because they'll use a term and it's yeah. like you don't talk like that here. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's okay. true. So and that's kind of know, the struggle like too. Even in English is when you have an author, let's say who's a British or Australian author, because we have them at the company. Usually the first thing I ask is, who do you want to market to? Because I want to be true to your voice, but if your audience is going to primarily be an American audience, do you want the 
grammar mm-hmm. to be in American English or do you want the grammar to be in your mm-hmm. home country, British English, uh, you know, UK English or Australian English? Because it's very different. So that's, you know, that's a mm-hmm. big part of translation yeah, as well. It, it is. So yeah. very, knowing, knowing those little things. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So very briefly, because I don't want to go crazy on time here, I'll go into the next big two, which is media and then film TV. So media is going to fall under these gaming apps and which are becoming very popular. And there's new ones that spring up every day. The majority of the apps are actually going to fall under your ebook rights if they're taking the book and just doing it to a new distribution platform that is the app, right? So if they're not doing any kind of visuals or any type of gaming feature and it's just an ebook that they are putting on their platform, even if they're selling coins, even if they're breaking it down to chapters, it's still just an ebook that falls under your ebook rights. However, If they are going to do any type of illustration, uh, 3D gaming, pick your next adventure, animation type, if they're going to add that to the ebook, it's Mm -hmm. it's more of an interactive ebook. And then that falls to media rights, which is a different rights. So know your rights. This is a different (laughs) one. And they're going to have, again, different terms, different things. They're going to offer you um, whatever. Media rights, you can, if it's a gaming app, it does not go against, at the moment, Amazon's terms of service if you're in the KU program with them. If it's, again, if it's an interactive type of media, if it's a straight ebook, you must be wise. Do not mess with the Zon when it comes to that, please. That's a, that's a big thing that I've found with authors. They'll, they'll go on and get offers from these different apps and they'll say, oh, great, you know. I can go ahead and put my book up there. Then they're in KU and they're in violation of Amazon terms of service. And then you're in a whole mess. So don't do that. So make sure you know if it's an ebook right or a media right. That's the biggest thing I can say about that. You don't need, you know, an outside platform. Most of these apps are going to come to you, especially if you're selling well. I would always recommend that you have a lawyer look over any contract terms. That's really important with these particular contracts because again like I said a lot of these are springing up not all of them are good not all of them are legitimate even the ones that are you know are they're still newer companies so be aware of of all of those things and last but not least we'll dive into film tv rights very very briefly because this is by far the hardest thing that you would ever do as an indie author Um, to develop an independent film requires a money Just bottom line, it requires money. I don't care if you have the smallest $10,000 budget for a film or a million plus dollar film. You know, it's going to require out of pocket funds if you in any way want to create an independent film. So that's 99% of people are not going to do that. You're going to try to sell your film TV rights. And the way you're going to do that is usually through an agent. It's much more difficult to pitch directly to producers or studios or things like that again sometimes they will come to you and they will say that they are interested and there's two major kinds of uh agreements but before we get into this sherry anything about media or gaming or film tv stuff so that i don't monopolize this podcast oh, fine. <laughs> um i'm i'm just sitting here listening fascinated um my only thing with with the media would be i would i mean you correct me if i'm wrong but i would think that most of those um most of those are going to kind of fall into more in the realm of like sci-fi fantasy type authors i can't i mean am i am i wrong in actually a lot of contemporary a lot of contemporary romance yeah really (laughs) what are they doing with (laughs) them how are it's, they doing interactive stuff with contemporary romance? So if you've Please ever tell seen, me they're not like creating It's kind of like okay. Have you ever seen the the oh god, the old school games? They're kind of like not choose your own adventure, but they're almost like an RPG, like a role playing game where you have the little person pop up it's and like, like Sims and stuff. Oh, yeah, like hi, I'm so and so and this is okay. my blah, 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 this is my story. That's kind of very similar to what they do in an animated form. And then they take you through the book story as if you are that character. And and contemporary is hot. <laughs> 
Okay. Yeah. I I I I I am definitely out of the loop on that one. I just <laughs> that 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 boggles my mind. I'm trying to visualize this here, and I'm just going, okay, I, it's not making sense to me, but I will take your word for it. For uh, <laughs> YouTube watchers, I'll put uh, some screenshots of what this might look like up here. So you'll have to come if you're listening on another platform. Again, don't forget to give us a thumbs up, but come over to YouTube so that you can see the screenshots of what this looks like. Okay, so yes. really quick, back to yes. film TV. Okay. There's there's yes. two big types of agreements, and the first one is a shopping agreement, meaning that you are signing your film TV rights for, let's say, three months so that this producer can go and shop your book to the different studios. Um, and a lot of the time that comes with nothing. That comes with, with, with zero dollars. You're just saying, hey, you can have my rights for this amount of time to go ahead and try to get this sold. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you now, if you give your rights to an agent, they are going to do that for you. They are going to go directly to all the studio houses. And that's like a normal agent agreement that you would have for any other rights. So that can be for any amount of time that you dictate. Usually it's, you know, the agent has, let's say two years to do this or whatever, but you decide that and then they get their 15%, which is standard uh, agent commission. Okay. Right. So, but that's, but that's if a producer comes direct to you, it's a shopping agreement. The second one is more of a licensing agreement where, or it's called options. Sometimes they, if you ever heard my, my book was optioned for TV film, right? You hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. That means that they are giving you X amount of dollars. The, the production company or the producer directly is saying, mm -hmm. okay, here's a thousand dollars for us to option your film. And then we are going to try to raise the capital to get it made into a mm -hmm. movie or a TV series. And a lot of the times that means a, almost, so all of the things that get optioned, you are automatically getting some money for depending upon the agreement but it does not mean your book is going to get made into a a uh, movie or tv program no and a and a perfect example of that is outlander yep because Di diana gambledon had tr basically tried to get her her books made into either tv or film mm -hmm. for 20 years mm -hmm. and she has been she's on record saying that her book was optioned multiple times multiple times yep and it took 20 years for that one of those options to actually result in production of her stories exactly. onto uh you know screen so yeah, it, it definitely doesn't, but I mean, it does help that, you know, if you, if it's optioned, at least you're getting, you know, some sort of monetary compensation for, for that. So, I mean, that does, that does exactly. like kind of lessen the sting, I guess, of it's having never to just a bad have to thing. wait, wait, and wait. Right. I mean, if it's mm -hmm. optioned, you know, multiple no. times and doesn't get made, like you said, you're still getting paid each time it's optioned. The hardest thing I think is the shopping agreement. Um, which is why you want to, if you do agree to a shopping agreement and there's nothing wrong with it, but make sure it's a limited amount of time, three to six months, no more than that, because you don't want them holding on to those rights forever, especially if an option can come up outside of the shopping agreement. Because if it does, then mm -hmm. you are beholden to the person that you've signed the shopping agreement with and they're going to take, you know, their percentage. The or royalty, the yeah, their royalties, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think this is something that a lot of authors are extremely interested in because um, so many are like, I would love to see my book on, you know, television or as a movie or what have you. It's kind of sure. like that far off, you know, like dream, I guess, right. for a lot of authors. I always think it's interesting because, you know, I, I, you know, I, it's one of those things was like, you know, it would be nice, but I kind of wonder how my books would translate. That's a that really good point. And that's something not we talk every book to the does authors. that. We talk to the authors a lot about this, right? Because I say mm -hmm. all the time, I write alien smut. Like I proudly write alien smut and I enjoy it. The chances of that translating to the screen are slim to none. Like maybe, mm -hmm. you know, Netflix might someday decide, oh, you know what we need on our platform? Some alien smut. But like, most likely it's not going to translate <laughs> well, right? So you have to be very realistic of mm -hmm. is your book a big picture type of book that is going to translate to screen? Because a lot of books don't. 
So if if mm-hmm. it's your dream to see your book on the big screen, one, understand it is extremely difficult, especially if your book does not have good sales, because although that's not necessarily something that people are looking for, sometimes they're just looking for the hottest new idea. Um, it does make it easier. So like producing, mm-hmm. you know, if Outlander that was selling really well took all these options to get produced, imagine now if the book's not selling, it's not really a big mm-hmm. picture, hot idea. It's not out of the box, you know, thing. It's going to be that much harder to produce. So just just be very realistic with is your story really compatible for screen or not? Yeah, yeah. And like I said, it, it really, you know, it's like my my books, I mean... I do have some that I think would be decent for screen, um, but it it really, I deal with a lot of, like my Finding It a series, again, I keep going back to this, but it's my best selling series. I have had so many readers say, oh, you, I would love to see this on the screen. Mm-hmm. But as I, but the more I, I thought about it so much and I'm like, I don't know if it would translate. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's, just because something is a good makes a good book does not necessarily mean that it makes a good television show or movie. And my 100%. fear, I am I am so attached to my Finding Anna series. I don't even know if I would be okay. Like, oh, that would devastate me if they screwed up stuff. In That's Mariana. another <laughs> really good part. If you are lucky enough to get option and if you are lucky enough to get it into production, understand that your rights as the author, unless again, you are Diana Gabaldon or Nora Roberts or Stephen King or somebody like that, the chances of you Mm -hmm. actually having a say in anything are very, very small. Like you could negotiate to help with the script writing. If you are an experienced script writer, please do not take this on if you are not, because again, script writing, totally different from novels. Um, If you Mm -hmm. want to have casting choice, Good luck. I wish you well. Like the chances of you being involved are going to be very slim. So again, mm-hmm. that's another realistic thing that you have to, you know, take in. Is this something that I'm willing to give up on? And as far as actually happening, I would say it's similar to finding somebody for foreign rights. You want to go to Publishers Marketplace. You want to see who's actually made deals with different studios, who is successful in pitching to film and TV, and then make your case to that agent as to why your book should be pitched. Right. Oof. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a lot. It's, it really is. A lot. It? Like, but again, that's the whole point. Is it, this is, so, <laughs> this is such an overwhelming topic. Yeah. That I think that's why a lot of authors shy away from it. They don't dive into it and they stick to eBooks and print because there's so much information. And if you don't know what you're doing, it can be really, really scary and potentially hazardous because there are a, there are a lot of people who, you know, will prey on somebody's not you know lack of oh, yeah. knowledge. And I I go back to and this goes for any time you're signing a contract for your business. I don't you know get a lawyer get a lawyer lawyer lawyer. lawyer. Ser- seriously, get a lawyer. And I have said this. I have said this before on the podcast and I'm not sponsored by anything, but legal shield is a great option for you to uh, sign up for. It's a monthly fee. You, you basically get, you can have, you have lawyer, you can get a lawyer's uh, advice, have them look over contracts for no additional fee. So you're just paying that monthly fee just like you would anything else. And they, they'll they look over up to a 10-page contract for you and tell you they looked over my first contract when I signed with a publisher. They've looked over contracts for me when I've, uh, you know, signed up for anthologies. Um, and so it's great because you have a legal thing. And if you have any trouble, if you have trouble with, a, you know, like a cover designer or a formatter, or any, any type of legal type question, you can pick up the phone and call them and get legal advice and know that you're actually what your rights are and what your option, your legal options are. And that's awesome. It's a peace of mind thing. I, I just for me, it's worth I think right. it's worth paying the monthly fee 
to be able to pick up the phone anytime I need to yeah. and talk to a lawyer. So not and sponsored, but if they would like to sponsor sponsored. us, we are available for sponsorship. Yes. <laughs> yes, we are. We are available for sponsorships, but it's not sponsored. But I have been with them. I've actually been a member. I've been with that service for over 10 years. Wow. So that's awesome. I, 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 it's to me, like I said, it's worth the, it's worth the monthly fee to just have that lawyer kind of at your fingertips. Cause yeah. if you've ever priced lawyers before, just to have like a sit down or have them look over a contract, it's you're probably going to pay close to your entire year's membership. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's listen, it is not a cheap thing to have a lawyer look over a legal contract. But at the same time, you don't want to be tied into a bad contract because right. that that it just makes it, you know, 10 times worse. Um, Just one thing yeah. real quick before we, you know, mm-hmm. wrap this up. I didn't yeah. mention with audio rights, the typical range is seven to 10 years for an audio contract. So keep that in mind. That's that's not a red flag. That's up to you whether you decide you want to do that or not. But that is the average range of audio contracts. So just something to consider. Yes. And and with Audible, I know I know with Audible, they're kind of a little sneaky about mm. uh, how they end their, their seven years. Like they don't really tell you from what I've heard. Hmm. If you enter into one of those narrator contracts, like uh, the royalty share Mm -hmm. contracts it's i think theirs are seven years and they don't really tell you when it ends but if you don't like cancel it before that set like you don't say yes i want to cancel it at that seven years they'll renew it that's that's (laughs) also typical with a lot of contracts like this is you have to put in writing that you want to cancel your contract usually Mm -hmm. 60 to 90 days before the contract ends. And the contract usually starts not when you sign it, but when the the, whatever the product is actually goes to market. So let's say Mm -hmm. you sign a contract in January, right, of the of whatever Mm -hmm. year, but then your whatever product it is doesn't go to market until September. Your Mm -hmm. contract terms actually start in September. So something to keep in mind. mm -hmm. I would still I would still be. 60 to 90 days from January. And then when they tell you you're too early, just every month I would be sending if Mm -hmm. you wanted to cancel until they confirm the cancellation. Mm -hmm. But again, that's another, that's another thing where I, where this lawyer thing is a, is a good idea. Understanding your terms of service because they can look at a website like, you know, and tell you like they can read over the terms of service for you and Mm -hmm. tell you this is what you need to know are you allowed to do this or are you not allowed to do this what do you need to know or be concerned about right so like i said i just i i would not ever sign a contract for my business without having it go over we might have to do a whole other podcast on contract terms like not legal advice but just general contract terms of because there's things that we've kind of learned over the years and Oh, yes. Yeah. But it's a good topic for a future conversation. Yeah. So anything else you want to cover before we I mean, I've, I've scratched the surface of all this <laughs> stuff. So if anybody has questions, again, that you want us to do a deep dive on in any of these topics or any other rights topics or contract terms, um, mm-hmm. just let us know in the comments. Again, give us some feedback. We're happy to to podcast about pretty much any topic author related. So all questions yeah. are welcome. Yes, all definitely right. for sure. And gives us topics to talk to talk about instead of us sitting here brainstorming going, <laughs> what should we talk about next week? <laughs> <laughs> oh. It always helps. We'd rather talk about stuff that you would like to hear us talk about than yeah. just kind of uh, brainstorming it because what we think is important may not be what you would like to hear. So please give us some feedback. Um, but, uh, we will wrap this up here today for this topic and tune in next time, uh, next week, Monday noon, Eastern time for another episode of bound by books. Bye. Bye. Wait, before you go, don't forget to like comment and subscribe and check us out on our website, boundbybookspodcast.com.